Welcome to the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh's Case Notes podcast. Over the next few months, we're going to work our way around the body head to toe, exploring different body parts and organs and their history in a cultural, medical, social sense. We're going to hear from a historian or curator about their work studying these body parts and their history. And we'll finish up each episode by exploring some of the recipes that were developed in history to treat that part of the body. Welcome to the podcast today. I am Daisy Cunningham. I am the college's heritage manager. Um, And I'm Olivia Howarth, and I am a volunteer with the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh Heritage. And today we are moving around the body and we have made it as far as the eye. So I guess to kind of start off with, I was trying to look for things that are very specifically Scottish or Scottish related. And one of the big things that that comes um, out of that side of it is the evil eye. So the evil eye is a concept which has existed in in many different cultures. It's not purely Scottish, but the Highlands of Scotland particularly was really fascinated by the concept of the evil eye. So this is the idea that a person can sort of of essentially ruin your life, put a curse on you um, just by looking at you or by looking at the thing that they want to curse that belongs to you. So it can do sort of almost anything. It can make you sick in a whole myriad of very unpleasant ways. It can make your donkey sick. It can make your cattle sick. It can make your chicken sick. Um, It can make the milk dry up. It can make the the eggs go bad. It can do just about anything that, that you kind of choose it to do. And there's a lot written about how you can combat the evil eye. Um, So a lot of it, and this is the bit that I particularly liked, is about distracting the person who is trying to put the curse on you. So one example would be to use thread. There's a lot about using thread. That's a particularly Highlands concept. And you would tie lots of knots or or strangely kind of wrap up the thread. And people, the person would get so distracted trying to count the knots or trying to decipher the thread that they would forget to actually put a curse on you. The other one that I particularly liked is apparently a lot of amulets to combat evil eye are in phallic shapes. And again, the idea is that the person putting the curse on would sort of get so distracted by the genitals that they'd forget (laughs) to actually put the curse on. They'd be like, oh, genitals, what was I doing here again? I have no idea. I I think it feels very human that distracting is the method to go for. (laughs) I mean, that last one feels like a bit of a curveball, but the the thread and the eye, that sounds very much like... um... Greek mythology as well there were the three fates and they share one eye and there's the thread of life I think most of my knowledge of ancient Greece comes from the writing of Neil Gaiman so um, oh. I'm a bit limited <laughs> um, but no that absolutely essential and, and I think there is a lot of connections to other cultures and roots from other cultures there are some things that uh, become particularly highlands and I think in a lot of recipes of all sorts of just you know things that you have So in the Highlands, there's a lot of, you know, using fish for things, using thistles and nettles and things like that. So so there's this kind of historical route, but there's also real emphasis on the things that people just have around them in their lives. And thread would be one of those things. Is it at all related? Because there's the idea of the eye as a symbol of protection as well. It absolutely is interconnected. And that symbol, which is, you know, historically would have been called an amulet, would have been used as a protection. The evil eye is not a physical, tangible thing. It's obviously something, it's a curse. The eye amulet is a sort of protection from that sort of curse or that sort of malevolent spirit. And a lot of things to do with diseases of the eye or people going blind or or having eye problems, they're treated by what's called the doctrine of sympathy. So it's this sort of like for like. So there's a huge amount of eye um, remedies in recipe books. And a lot of them involve using eyes. So it would be take a sheep's eye. But the bit that I actually find even more disgusting than the idea of using eyes was they also used things that had the consistency of eyes. And they were very specific about this. So there's a lot of snails. Like gelatinous. Yeah. A lot of uh, bird dung. But the idea of sort of weighing it up and just thinking, what's like an eye? How were they using the cures? Is it like ingesting or... 
Uh, there's, there's, or? There, I mean, using it in almost any way you could think of, the one that particularly stuck with me was taking goose dung, drying it on a on an oven or on a fire, and then blowing the dust into the eyes. Oh, okay. That stuck with me. Mm. <laughs> But yes, yeah, so some of the worst treatments in that sort of sense, some of the ones that seem the most bizarre, at least in terms of the, the records that I've seen, they will go through everything else and then they're just sort of going, well, it doesn't really matter because we're now at a point where if this doesn't work, we've run out of ideas. Mm. There's a bit of a last ditch effort to some of <laughs> these things. I suppose it's also thinking about having problems with your vision it's also about what people's expectations were. I think perhaps in the 21st century, we have an expectation of a clarity of vision. Looking at both of us sitting here with our glasses on right mm. now, we have an expectation of a kind of precision which people just wouldn't have had in the past. They would have just accepted a level of lack of sight that meant they, they could still function, they could still exist, they could still do their jobs, but they couldn't perhaps see it particularly clearly. And part of that is perhaps, you know, literacy levels for, for a lot of history up until sort of maybe 1600s, 1700s even, were relatively low. I think it's amazing what you can get used to. Uh, and just thinking from a personal perspective, there have been points in my life where I have taken too long to get my prescription checked. And so I'll go in, you know, after five years or whatever, get some new glasses, and then I can see really clearly. And I think, yes. oh, I hadn't even realised that what I was seeing before was blurry. I hadn't even registered that it wasn't right and until I got some new glasses. And I went, oh. It always feels like a bit of a shock. Yeah. So so in terms of the kind of origins of it, spectacles um, and, and sort of that kind of precision of sight. So the actual manufacturer, as I understand it, um, it, you know, began it in Venice and areas around Venice where there's a lot of glass blowing industry already. There was a thing which was called a reading stone, which was sort of the first iteration, which was, as I, as, if I can picture it correctly, is 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 like a almost like a magnifying glass, I suppose. But you don't put it up against your eye; you put it on the page or hold it over the page. So it's sort of the process of spectacle development is the process of taking the stone that you hold over the page and putting it over your eye instead, <laughs> essentially. But it took a really long time to develop spectacles in the sense that we think them with frames attached. So you get spectacles in in some sort of sense in the sort of 1300s 1400s you know these sort of stones that you put over things but it's the 1700s before you get spectacles with frames there's a really long period where people have monocles or they have sort of uh, lenses that are sort of these strange contraptions that if you look them up online look very bizarre which are sort of attached to a hat or a wig that sort of are held that way or you'd have them on a stick it's a really long oh, time before people are like, wouldn't it be nice if I didn't have to use my hand while I was doing this? Sort of like opera glasses. Yeah. I mean, certainly for uh, from the reading that I've done, it seems like for a very long time, um, you know, glasses really are something for the elite, you know, because they're individually handmade. Um, and I suppose the fact that, you know, you, you're not hands free implies a certain sort of leisure and relaxation. That really it's only in the 1800s that they can mass produce these things and so they're more available to sort of ordinary people but it's also then connected to um you know ideas of scholarship ideas of being an, an intellectual you know as reading increases and you need glasses to be able to read so if you have glasses that's probably a sign that you do read and you are clever and intellectual so it, it gets tied in with all these sort of social cultural things um, and one thing, one article that I read that I, I really enjoyed was uh, this guy had done a study of all of the sort of famous paintings or significant paintings that had been made of people wearing glasses in periods when glasses didn't exist. So, you know, you that paint... sounds fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> Because it is has so many associations that they're sort of we're painting a figure, uh, you know, we're commissioning you to paint a picture of our great grandfather. Now, he existed at a point when glasses with frames did not exist. However, 
he we want everyone to think that he's incredibly smart so would you stick a pair of glasses on him so there's all these <laughs> paintings out there of sort of these great figures from sort of early modern history with their with their nice pair of glasses sitting there um, <laughs> There's a lot of theories in the 1600s about the impact of light on the eye. And so they try experimenting with different colors of lenses. So there's this period in the 1600s where there's loads of um, um, images, illustrations and descriptions of people with sort of bright green lenses on their glasses. And it looks like something sort of cyberpunk almost. It looks like they're all wearing sunglasses, but it's the 1600s. So that feels really incongruous. Yeah. Oh, I'm just thinking of that um, Francis Ford Coppola film of Dracula where he steps into a Victorian street wearing blue sunglasses. You think it's very steampunk, but maybe it's not so inaccurate. It's it's this sort of... It's, I, I can only imagine how difficult it is when, you know, making films and television that actually sometimes being really accurate probably to the viewer makes it look less accurate. Do you have anything else on your list? Uh, well, I have a lovely timeline I found about the history of trachoma apparently it's been around for so long that they found evidence of it in ice age ice age skeletons and it was one of the things that they looked for when people were migrating to america and so on ellis island they used to have people that specifically looked for trachoma and they used a button hook to examine your eyes um so that there was this phrase that was like beware the button hook men that's a nightmare phrase. That's a yeah. phrase from your nightmares. I don't like that. Yes. Um, and not to bring him up again, but Francis Ford Coppola <laughs> in his part two of The Godfather, Vito Corleone goes through Ellis Island and in one scene, um, it shows him having his eyes checked for trachoma. We were the button hook eye man. Was that what you said? But we're the button hook men. They, that, that feels like the tagline from a horror movie. Or something. <laughs> um, yeah, supposedly um, it was also Charles Dickens had a novel, Nicholas Nickleby, and there's a school um, that's in that book that supposedly was inspired by a real life school where lots of children went blind due to neglect. And that's thought to have been trachoma that caused it. It, it just pops up in lots of... <laughs> <laughs> lots of cultural moments also like the Ebers papyrus I think has stuff about trachoma in it and uh, there are hieroglyphs that show eyes and tweezers um, which may or may not be trachoma might be something else but it's interesting <laughs> I think I think there's there's definitely in terms of recipe books there's certain sort of common themes that you get throughout and um, I think skin, guts, and eyes are, you know, it, it, it just makes sense. They're they're sensitive, they're open, they're always open, well, mostly open, and they're right there. You know, it, it, it makes sense that that's going to be kind of through the ages, sort of a common theme. And I think it's obviously also just tricky. What do you do? They, you know, for such a long time, most of the things they recommended with eyes were not really very helpful. In our case study today, we're going to look at the history of sunglasses. There's a bit of a debate about the timeline of the development of sunglasses and exactly what we mean when we say sunglasses. But eyewear to protect the eyes from light has existed in one form or another for thousands of years. Somewhere around 2000 years ago, eye goggles or eye shields were developed by indigenous peoples of North Asia and North America to protect the eyes from snow blindness. The goggles were made of various materials, including driftwood, ivory, bone and leather. They were essentially strips worn across the eye, with thin slits cut in them to see through. In China, tinted lenses were in use by the 1100s. Most likely made of smoked quartz, these glasses may have had many purposes, therapeutic and ceremonial. Some sources even suggest that they were worn by judges with the purpose of hiding their facial expressions during trials in order to present an impartial appearance in the court. Not much progress in the development of sunglasses seems to have taken place for some time. In the mid-1600s, tinted lenses were in use on the continent, particularly in Italy. 
In the 1700s, another experimenter in London developed blue and green tinted lenses to correct vision impairments, although his aim was not to protect from the sun. There are some arguments that the wearing of yellow and brown tinted glasses was common in the late 1800s and early 1900s as a treatment to relieve the symptoms of syphilis, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence to back this up. But sunglasses did grow in popularity in the 1800s, probably as a result of the increase in outdoor sports, seaside holidays and recreational bathing. Tinted spectacles were also popular amongst those travelling in open-top motor cars and open-car railroads to protect not only from the sun, but from the wind, smoke and dirt. And experiments on light passing through blue lenses, which took place in the 1850s, led to the association of mystical powers with the wearers of blue glasses. As a result, mystics, fortune-tellers and quacks would often don blue glasses when plying their trades. From the 1920s onwards, particularly in America, sunglasses began to be mass-produced and sold on a large scale, fashion accessories by this point, as much as health-preserving aids. In this short excerpt, Dr Lauren Barnett explores the role of the visual, or photography and illustration, in diagnosing and treating patients. In this talk, I'm going to address a deceptively simple question. Given the importance of images in medical education and the universally acknowledged power of photography, why do medical textbooks contain so few photographs? Now, photographs in textbooks tend to be very common. I'm sure we've encountered them all. However, this isn't necessarily true of medical anatomy textbooks. What's the story here? When first medical photographs were taken in 1840, the camera was presented as a revolution in medical education and in psychiatry and pathology. However, despite the popularity of photographs in other fields, medical photography became secondary to medical illustration. Illustrations were clearer, softer, much less messy. Illustrators could wipe away blood, extra muscles, tendons, and layers of confusion in order to reveal an organ or a complex system of capillaries in an idealized way. Photographs could not. They only captured the messy, grim reality of a difficult and bloody human body. So you might think, case closed. Photographs are not as clear as medical illustration. Most historians have followed that line of thinking. But I'm going to tell another richer story, one of power, class struggle, and dehumanization. Early medical photographs struggled with two concerns. They alienated the subject, and they were ugly. Photographs present the reality of contorted, tired, exhausted, bloodless, disfigured faces. Photographs suggest that all of us are, in fact, as ugly as each other. So what then of the refined, elegant Victorian gentleman or woman when they became sick? The argument at the time is that ugliness indicated criminality or mental deficiency, so the elite needed to find a way to be both ill and not ugly. These examples present a case for clear aesthetic illustrations over ugly, unclean photographs. Furthermore, in addition to being messy, photographs also struggled to isolate the specific parts of the body and alienate a patient from the physical symptoms in a way medical illustration could. In his 1963 book, The Birth of the Clinic, Foucault described le regard, the gaze, as central to new clinical medicine that emerged in Paris at the time of the French Revolution. The gaze of the clinician, the clinical gaze, penetrates the body of the patient to reveal internal structures of the body and to bring to light the, quote, truth of the disease to the doctor. The clinical gaze is described by Foucault as both detached and objectifying, in that it transforms the patient from a living, subjective individual into a site of medical investigation. This alienates both the person of the doctor and of the patient. Quote, they are tolerated by the gaze as disturbances that can hardly be avoided. And in neutralizing the patient, the doctor rejects the patient's subjectivity. The objectivity of the patient and doctor are key, but while the gaze objectifies the patient, who Foucault rightly or wrongly assumed wouldn't counter the gaze, the doctor is in control of the gaze. 
providing him or her with power in that situation. In other words, the doctor created knowledge solely by seeing, through the act of seeing isolating the patient from the disease, and it also isolates the body from the individual and certain areas of the body from the body as a whole. Not only is the patient objectified, but they're often not viewed as a unified corpus. With the patient insignificant in the eyes of the doctor, the doctor becomes a kind of camera, an objective observer that can frame, can dominate the person in front of them, alienating them from their whole body and from the pathological processes within it. In some areas of medicine, we see value of this categorization that alienating medical gaze can bring with it. In relation to medical photography, we can see useful alienation in microbiology, which allows doctors to identify and photograph diseases in order to understand how disease works, how the body responds to it, and to identify potential cures. The struggle in clinical medical photography is how to isolate the diseased part of the body from the patient as a whole. Welcome to Recipes of Yore. We're going to explore some unusual medical recipes from the past. The way in which the word recipes was used in the past is a bit different from how it's used today. So it could mean recipes for cooking, for medicine, or even recipes for cleaning products or cosmetics. Very few of them were treatments we would recognise in the 21st century, and certainly none of these should be tried at home. The list of potential problems with the eye which required treatment was a long one. Strokes of the eye dirt in the eye, spots in the eye, changing colour of the cornea, inflammation, ulcers, involuntary weeping, red eyes and blindness. And probably one of the most alarming is something which was called falling out of the eyes. According to the recipe book of apothecary John Moncrief, the treatment for inflammation of the eye was, quote, cheese put on the eyes, sugar put in the eyes, the leaves of house leek applied, parsley with bread put too. Snails bruised in a clean mortar together with a hen's egg, boiled and bound to the forehead with unwashed wool or juice of blue bottle dropped in. For dim eyes, quote, the blood of a dove or of a partridge, the gall of a white hen or the gall of a wild goat. Powdered fennel and aniseed, meanwhile, was a very multi-purpose medicine. It would not only improve the eyesight, but, quote, also purge wind and make one that is old seem young a good time after. For watery eyes, John Moncrief recommended, quote, pigeon's blood put hot in the eyes or young pigeons slit up the back applied to the eyes. For white spots in the eyes, quote, an oil made of burnt rags mixed with the spittle of a child and laid on with a feather. The treatments for inflammation were mostly food-based, including fresh cheese, the white of an egg, a roasted apple, veal, mutton and butter. Unfortunately, very few of these were to be eaten. Most were laid on or dropped into the eye. Another cure for inflammation was, quote, to set the patient upon a seat straight, take hold on both sides of his head and shake it. For ulcers in the cornea, quote, Take a hard roasted egg, peeled, cut it in two pieces, and taking out the yolk, fill the hollow with the powder of sugar candy, tie it fast and hang it in a wine cellar, and you shall have a water drop from it, which is excellent to cleanse the eyes without pain. Much medicine in the 1600s and 1700s was based on the idea of sympathy. This meant the connection between different body parts, and the connection between those body parts and treatments. Under this model, one common treatment for problems with the eyes was to use eyes as medicine. So, for example, in John Moncrief's book, he stated that, quote, The eyes of a crow hung about the neck, healeth all infirmities of the eyes. The lights of a hare suddenly ease pain, and the hot lights of a sheep put upon the eyes soon cureth bloody eyes. Some of the more alarming treatments included, quote, Ashes of man's dung put into the eyes, cureth all spots and dimness, and dove's blood cast into the eyes binds the blood of them. Thank you for listening to this Case Notes podcast. 
If you'd like to find out more about the work we do, you can visit our website at rcpe.ac.uk forward slash heritage. You can also find us on Twitter at RCPE Heritage, and we have a Just Giving page, RCPE Heritage, linked to on our website if you'd like to support our work and help to fund future podcasts. Thank you.